Good morning. Good morning. We gather here today to celebrate the life of William Edward Bill Spriggs. We join today with his family, his friends, Howard University, AFL-CIO, and a host of other people and institutions who mourn the loss but applaud the achievement that was his life. Today, even as the range of people you will hear from is remarkable, it is but a small representation of the outsized impact Bill Spriggs had on the world. You all know him differently and you will hear him called by different names. I am sure there will be as many moments that will surprise you as there will be moments that seem and feel incredibly familiar. We are grateful that we spent some time walking this earth in the company of Bill Spriggs and through him in the company of that ancestral community that made him uniquely him and every man at once. We invite now the spirit of those ancestors to join us in opening the way as we celebrate a life well lived. Offering our opening prayer is Deacon Jeffrey Grant from the First Baptist Church of Vienna. Deacon Grant's prayer will be followed by the scripture and then by a solo from Melissa Constantin. The tributes will follow in order with a small break in between. They are printed on the program and they will proceed as printed here. We have invited those who are celebrating Bill's life through tributes to offer again, just a glimpse of the time that they spent with Bill and a glimpse of what he meant to them and to us. That glimpse has been limited to three minutes. <laughs> we hope that our speakers will honor that. We certainly know that those who offered video tributes did their very best. And please join us again in celebrating Bill's life. Deacon Grant. Let us pray. God, we pray, we give thanks, and we celebrate the life of Dr. Wim Edward Spriggs. We particularly pray for Jennifer, Will, and their beloved family in this time of sorrow and celebration. As we extend our sincere condolences, God, please grant them peace, comfort, and strength in their lives with each rising of the sun until the going down of the same. For we find comfort in your faithfulness and promises. God, we give thanks for the distinguished yet humble Christian personhood of Bill Spriggs his tremendous contributions to the country in the career of economics and his passion for racial economic justice in addition to the giving of himself as a son, sibling, spouse, father, relative, friend, mentor, colleague, and much more. Let the beloved memories of Bill live on within our spirits and the memories cherished the most just dwell deeply within as we think of the person he was and still is in our hearts. God, we celebrate the life Bill lived among us, and now his soul is at rest with you, for we are confident in our celebration. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. To God be the glory. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen, amen, and amen. The Old Testament reading is taken from Proverbs chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. Proverbs chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. A wise man will hear 
and will increase learning. And a man of understanding shall attain unto wise counsels. To understand a proverb and the interpretation, the words of the wise and their dark sayings, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. But the fools despise wisdom and instruction. My son, hear the instruction of thy father, and forsake not the law of thy mother. The New Testament reading is from 2 Corinthians chapter 1, excuse me, chapter 5, verse 1 and 6 through 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1 and 6 through 8. For we know that if our earthly house of this tabernacle were dissolved, we have a building of God and house not made with hands eternal in heaven. Therefore, we are always confident, knowing that whilst we are at home in the body, we are absent from the Lord. For we walk by faith, not by sight. We are confident, I say, and willing rather to be absent from the body and to be present with the Lord. May you be blessed by the inspired words of the Lord. Thank you.
Thank you, Melissa. Offering tributes on behalf of the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations, the AFL-CIO, is President Elizabeth Schuler, who I invite to come now. She will be followed by Dr. Jarrett Bernstein, Chair of the Council of Economic Advisors, and then by Dr. Greg Carr, Associate Professor of African American Studies and University, Howard University Adjunct Professor of Law at the Howard University Law School. The videos will also play as follows. Good morning, good morning everyone. I am so deeply honored to be able to speak today on behalf of the AFL-CIO family. To Jennifer, who Bill was so devoted to, to William, Patricia, Karen, the entire Spriggs family, I want to offer my deepest condolences. And I have the great privilege today of representing two groups. The first is every coworker at the AFL-CIO who knew and loved Bill. To be clear, that is every person Bill ever met. The second group is workers and families all over this country, and I would say the world. And there are millions of them whose lives directly were made better by Bill because he fought for them every single day. And as our economist friends in the room know, there's a big gathering every year in Jackson Hole, Wyoming hosted by the leaders of the Federal Reserve, where some of the brightest minds in the country gather to talk about important economic issues. This is the Mount Olympus of economic policymakers, and it's gone on for decades. Yet to my knowledge, not once had a labor economist ever been invited to go, until Bill Spriggs. Bill got the invite sometime around 2013. And as he was putting together his presentation, he heard about this group of community activists who held their own conference every year in a tent right across the street. So Bill came up with this incredible idea, and I don't think he told anyone ahead of time. He attended this high-level meeting with the most important economic minds in the country. He gave this presentation and then he stood up, walked across the street, and gave the exact same presentation to the group of community activists sitting in the tent. He sat with them as long as they wanted. He took their questions, which I'm guessing would have broken some unwritten rule of the Fed meeting, uh, but yet somehow, year after year, they would invite him back. To me, that says so much about Bill. He had this incredible ability not to just inhabit these two worlds, but to be absolutely beloved and necessary to both. Bill wasn't an economist with a foot in the civil rights movement. He was the human link between them. Bill wasn't only this 
expert of the numbers. He was someone who deeply believed in people. And today, Twitter isn't really much, good for much, you know, um, but I'd encourage everyone to go back and look at his Twitter account. Um, because he had tweets every month when the job numbers came out. Uh, you would, you know, see all the rest of the analysts saying, oh, here are the jobs that have been added. Here's the unemployment rate. But Bill would have this granular analysis that would, you just almost couldn't fathom. And when he sat down with the board of the Fed, he knew the data better than they did. Yet he'd be the first to tell you the numbers were just a way to get to what really mattered. When Bill opened up a spreadsheet, he saw his dad, Thurman, in those numbers. He saw his mother, Julienne, and every public school teacher like her. He saw families from working class neighborhoods like his. Bill didn't use economics to escape the complexity of the world. He used it to help people. And it hurts, it really hurts to lose him right now. Right when this movement that he was instrumental in building is on the verge of something incredible. Right when we are starting to look and feel and act every day like the movement he always dreamed of. White and black and brown and AAPI and people of every background standing together. So it's on us to keep going. I think about how utterly devoted Bill was to Howard and HBCUs, how he made sure the entire labor movement paid attention to our fight for racial justice. We will move that work forward every day. I think about how he used his knowledge not to lord over people, but to help them understand. We will teach in that same spirit. And I look at how unfailingly he treated every person, no matter their job, their background, their beliefs, with dignity and respect, the respect they deserved. We will do the same every single day. We will make sure Bill is always, always part of this movement, and we will be that much better forward for it. Thank you so much. I am, uh, I am profoundly grateful to be here today to share both the pain uh, that Liz so uh, trenchantly just uh, talked about, as well as the joy of celebrating uh, the career and the insights of Bill Spriggs. You know, I, I love this picture, and uh, I have resolved to uh, frame it and put it on my desk. Uh, and the re one reason I love it is because of that smile. That's the smile where on rare occasions I would challenge something Bill said, and with a little bit of very efficient argumentative jujitsu, he would completely prove me wrong in about three sentences, and then he would make that smile. <laughs> I love that, and I will have that with me every day. Uh, I, I, uh, I know I'm not the only one here who uh, has made little progress in wrapping my head around a world without Bill Spriggs. And while Bill made it an intentional top priority project to mentor and elevate many who shared his work, and we know who we are, many are here today, the simple fact is that he is irreplaceable. There are two reasons why that's the case. First, because Bill was well aware of the dangers of being over-specialized in economics, the risk of failing to see the forest for the trees and thereby failing to root out economic uh, uh, systemic injustice, he worked in many more areas than the average economist. And second, because of the powerful theme that ran through all of his work, whether he was analyzing job markets, unions, minimum wages, international trade, education policies, or monetary and fiscal policies. What was that unifying theme? With academic rigor and relentless energy, Bill used the tools of economics to challenge some of the field's most basic assumptions. He bridled at these assumptions. Ideas like merit is fully determinate of outcomes, or full employment is the labor market's natural state, 
or discrimination is something for sociologists, not economists to worry about, or minimum wages are disemploying full stop. More than any other economist I know, Bill was unstinting in challenging these economic assumptions, and he was a lifelong inspiration to those of us following in his wide wake. What does it mean to say Bill was an inspiration? Yes, it means today we reflect with his family on his life, his career, his friendship, his intensity, his great fondness, and as we, uh, we, with great fondness, and as we memorialize him with great sadness. But that's the least of it, that's just today. Much more lastingly, what it means is that our very approach, the one we bring to the table every day, whether we're in the think tank, the university, or the White House, is premised on what Bill taught us about flaws in the economic model. Allow me to briefly wax a bit technical for a moment, but I'll quickly make amends. In his powerful letter to economists following the murder of George Floyd, Bill wrote, quote, if you start with a model that has race as exogenous, racial differences cannot be objectively approached. The model begins with a fallacy that assumes racial differences as a natural order. It biases the model because there is a built-in excuse for disparities that cannot be solved, end quote. In my own work, I've thought about this as disequilibrium masquerading as equilibrium. Moving back into plain English, Spriggsian economics maintains that what is generally widely accepted as a steady, acceptable, even optimal state of affairs is nothing like that. What Bill taught us was not merely to avoid confusing the way things are with the way they should be. His deeper lesson was that the very methods and models and assumptions we employ in much, not all, in no small part thanks to his influence, but in much traditional economic analysis is profoundly racially biased. This critical insight, I assure you, is shared by President Biden and Vice President Harris. And that would be fine with Bill, uh, as he was at the beginning and the end of the day, a political economist, meaning an economist for whom power is a core variable in the model. Let me close by invoking current events. Over the last few weeks in the Biden administration, we introduced what we're calling Bidenomics, which the president describes as growing the economy from the bottom up and the middle out, and which we present in stark contrast to top-down, trickle-down economics. Well, 15 years ago, Bill told National Public Radio, quote, if you really want the economy to grow, it's like growing a rose bush. You water from the roots, close quote. And Bill being Bill, he didn't stop there. And yes, he added, it is the reverse of Ronald Reagan. <laughs> Thank you for allowing me to share these thoughts uh, with you today. And if I may close uh, by speaking to Bill's family for a moment, if there's anything, anything ever, I can do for you in Bill's name. Do not hesitate to ask, and the answer will be yes. Thank you. Hello, I'm Hugh Price, the former president and CEO of the National Urban League from 1994 until 2003. Like you, I was shocked and profoundly saddened by the sudden passing of Bill Spriggs. I deeply appreciate the invitation by his beloved wife, Jennifer, to share my reflections on Bill, who is one of the most gifted, principled, and unforgettable people I've ever known. You've undoubtedly seen the glowing tributes in the Washington Post, the New York Times, and elsewhere. President Biden called Bill a towering figure in his field, a trailblazer who challenged the field's basic assumptions about racial discrimination in labor markets, pay equity, and worker empowerment. Praise doesn't get any more lavish than that. I first got to know Bill when I headed the National Urban League. Let me briefly recount how and why. During my first keynote address at our annual conference in 1994, as might be expected, I acknowledged the well-documented and enduring effects of racism and discrimination on black folk. Yet I also urgently called attention to the treacherous economic seas that we must navigate. Technological change, right sizing, industrial migration, globalization, and structural unemployment were familiar phenomena in the U.S. and throughout the developed world. Low-paying service jobs in cities were replacing decent-paying blue-collar ones 
which had once enabled workers to purchase their own homes and new cars. Sadly, these service jobs often paid so miserably that the people who held them couldn't work their way out of poverty. Millions of our people were stranded on the down economic escalator, headed nowhere or worse. And the callous refusal of government to raise the minimum wage made matters even worse. Many politicians and economists were in denial about the depth of this problem. Some blamed its victims, saying that they didn't want to work, despite convincing evidence to the contrary. Others said high unemployment and lousy wages for low-skilled workers were the natural order of things in modern market economies, and the government ought not to interfere. This keynote address charted the course for my tenure at the helm of the League. The grim economic realities that I described presented research and public policy challenges galore for us. The next step was building the organizational capacity and assembling a team of colleagues with the expertise, experience, and passion to pursue our agenda. One of our top priorities was transforming our Washington office into a high-profile research and policy institute, which not only consumed and used research, we wanted to resurrect the League's traditional role of conducting original research about key issues confronting Black folks and low-income people. We called it the National Urban League Institute for Opportunity and Equality. My colleague, Milton Little, who was the League's Executive Vice President, identified Bill as the ideal candidate to lead our institute, and was he ever. Bill had stellar academic credentials with a PhD in economics. He shared our passion about civil rights, equality, opportunity, and social justice. Bill believed back then that racial justice and economic justice go hand in glove. And as we say, he took no prisoners on these issues. He was keen to recruit and mentor young PhD candidates who could undertake and publish the kinds of policy related studies that we had in mind. But we spotted even more potential in Bill than that. Given the importance of economic issues to our constituency, I was determined that the League would become a high profile go-to organization on economic policy affecting minorities and low income folks. I recall telling Bill that while I could speak in sound bites about economic policy for a couple of minutes in the media, we needed a powerhouse economist like him to go toe to toe with preeminent economists at policy forums and professional conferences on the McNeil Lair News Hour and NPR with cabinet members and the Federal Reserve Board and in testimony before the Congressional Black Caucus and congressional hearings. He delivered on these expectations and many more. And we had an exciting and immensely productive run with Bill at the helm of the Institute. After the league, Bill went on to bigger and more influential roles. I swelled with pride as he progressed through his distinguished academic career at Howard and as Assistant Secretary of Labor and Chief Economist of the AFL-CIO. In fact, in March of this year, I read in the New York Times Sunday Magazine about a governor of the Federal Reserve Board who said that he routinely checks with Bill to gauge how the Fed is doing. I emailed Bill to congratulate him for continuing to speak truth to power and for being a power source in his own right. I was deeply touched by his quick response. In an email I'll always treasure, Bill wrote, quote, I totally credit you for getting me to weigh in on the Fed. The pep talk you gave me on stepping up woke me out of my self-imposed box. Bill and I chatted from time to time over the years. Nary a conversation occurred without Bill waxing enthusiastic about Jennifer and Will. He shared updates on his courageous battle with cancer and provided advice and comfort when both my wife Marilyn and her brother Sterling Lloyd were struck with forms of cancer. Sterling preceded Bill at Williams College and for several decades served as Associate Dean of Howard Medical School. I'm truly blessed that my wife has beaten it although tragically, Sterling did not. Bill Spriggs was a great man and a great guy. Those aren't necessarily the same, and they don't always come in one package. This is the treasured friend and colleague. This is the hero I was privileged to know. Marilyn and I send our deepest condolences to Jennifer, Will, the extended Spriggs family, and the legions of Bill's friends and admirers. Thank you. Ms. Briggs, Will, to the whole family, 
our condolences as we celebrate the transition into ancestorhood of our friend and your family member, Bill Spriggs. As Dana said, I'm uh, Greg Carr. I'm a member of the faculty, honored to be one of the many who are here today and beyond who served with Bill Spriggs. And his transition, I think, probably has us all thinking about eternity. The ancient Egyptians had a couple of words for eternity, nehehe and uh, jet, but ultimately they mean in a sense, being everywhere. We're all in time and space as far as our limited perception of it, but we exist everywhere at once. And Bill Spriggs was everywhere as he walked on top of the earth. What we perceive as time goes fast. Remember that old gospel song? I remember this song, uh, Hold On to God's and Change Your Hand. <laughs> time is filled with swift transition. Some of y'all went to church like we did know that one, right? None on earth with hope can stand. Build your hopes on things eternal. Hold on to God's unchanging hand. We can't see God, but it takes a minute sometimes for our eyes to adjust to see the things that are in front of us. It took me a minute for my eyes to adjust to see Bill Spriggs. When I came to Howard in the year 2000, I came looking for those people I had read about. Deron Walters and Suleiman Yangs and so many others. And I found them, as we all did, as we came in this space. But Bill Spriggs was an economist. He didn't much about economics. The black economists I was familiar with were the ones that this society seems to kind of deal with because they ain't really trying to rock the boat. You know the Thomas Souls and the Walter Williams. I hope I ain't rocking nobody's feathers. Um, you know. <laughs> And those who kind of go back and forth, like Glenn Lowry and them boys, I, I knew them. And then every once in a while, there was somebody who'd punch him in the face. You're going to hear from Julianne Malvo a little bit later. But I didn't know Bill Spriggs. Well, <laughs> come to find out, Bill Spriggs was a quiet, loud presence. And when I got to Howard, that's when I met Charles Betsy and Ransford Palmer and Rodney Green and so many other uh, economists who were here, and I realized this is serious business and began to understand even more how economists may be charged with dealing with one dimension of our intellectual work, but they really deal with all of it, because what is economics? It's the study of how society is put together and how it can be put together better. And Bill Spriggs was a master of that, and as my eyes adjusted, I understood. And then Bill Spriggs came back. I say back to Howard because, I mean, you know, what is it like for your daddy to have come in through the Buffalo Soldiers and become a Tuskegee Airman? That's, that's like a legendary kind of move. And then your mom teaches you how to read and write while she's finishing her degree here. A master school teacher, a man with a PhD in physics. And then Spriggs rejoins this space that he left as a child after cycling through North Carolina a and I know some Aggie pride that grows out there. And then coming, <laughs> coming through Norfolk State, behold the green and gold. But the whole idea is, this, see, I went to a public HBCU. I'm an I'm HBCU field Negro, and Bill Spriggs always had that sensibility, even as he has this sensibility, too, understanding there's, it ain't number one big HBCU. And when he came back, like the best public intellectuals, he was an economist, but he's also a race man. Genealogies and, and generations everywhere at once, and he was everywhere. As we've heard, as we will continue to hear, CBC, Urban League, you name it, the feds in every kind of way, not just the Fed, Federal Reserve, but the federal government, as young people call it, the feds. Bill Spriggs is in the room representing us, but he is in the room for the people, as we heard a moment ago from Ms. Shuler, President Shuler, he's, he's in the room for the people who are not in the room with Janet Yellen, they in the room with their bills and looking their children in the face trying to figure this out. And when Bill Spriggs would open his mouth, you got this sense that he was bringing all of us into the room with him. And that's what a faculty should do at any university, but especially at HBCUs. Because unless we're just going to be a black-faced version of these other schools, that is the purpose for which we were called into existence. Our last conversation on top of the earth. Yeah, you clapping for this man. And you're right, that is that smile. <laughs> And I'm going to talk about that right now as I close. Last time um, I was at the College of Arts and Sciences recognition ceremony, that was 2022, wasn't last, this last one in May. Bill and I had been 
recruited into working, doing some work on the California Reparations Task Force. I was just testifying. Bill was one of the five, five economists, along with his friend and comrade Sandy Darity and others, who were working on crunching the numbers on reparations. And we were sitting side by side in the, in the College of Arts and Sciences graduation recognition ceremony, talking about this reparations commission. I wasn't convinced then, still not convinced now, that the idea of lineage-based reparations, even if the California State Constitution does ban uh, any race-based policy, is the right way to go. I'm talking, and you know how Bill, he'd be blinking, he's looking at you. <laughs> and then, as we're talking, Bill says, how can it help us? It didn't matter whether you agreed ideologically. I still don't know how Bill might play that on the policymaking side, but he got involved in that work to help us. And then he did what he often did in conversations with me, because you know, I'd be getting mad quick. He'd be like, yes, but, and then very quickly, yes, but, yes, and, yes, and. That's Bill Spriggs. Yes, and. And we talked about that. I don't know if any of y'all had this experience where you could leave a conversation with Bill Spriggs and think he agrees with you completely. <laughs> yeah, yes I am. And the last time I saw him, and I think Dana Roland is going, you got a video of Roland coming next. Last time I saw him, uh, we were together, Roland Martin had called us all together in person for the, uh, to respond to Joe Biden's State of the Union address. And yes, he was moving a little slower, but you know he talked about how much he missed being in the physical. And Bill Spriggs was everywhere. And during COVID, as all of my colleagues, Terry Adams sitting there, Jules Harold, so many others would tell you, he was always on social media. But then in COVID, he was always in a square box somewhere, sometimes five or 10 times a day. And he literally went everywhere during that period. So a lot more people found out what I got to find out in person, like many of us, this is the guy we should be listening to. He clowned me for missing this year's recognition ceremony. He said, oh, I'll see you next time, but in many ways I didn't miss it. I didn't miss it at all. Because Bill Spriggs is now no longer on top of the earth. He's everywhere. And soon we will join him. So thank you all for giving me a second to reflect and Ashe. I'm Roland Martin, host and managing editor of Roland Martin Unfiltered, founder of the Black Star Network. Uh, I'm here sitting on uh, our set, uh, and it was uh, just uh, four months ago uh, that uh, Bill Spriggs sat right across from me uh, when we had our State of the Union coverage. Uh, we had a number of people who were in studio talking about uh, the State of the Union address, um, and uh, it was electrifying because we had so many different people with different perspectives. Uh, and, uh, and Bill was one of those voices. Uh, when Dr. Greg Carr reached out to me to tell me that uh, Bill had passed away, um, I was uh, shocked and stunned. The first thing that came to mind was, who am I now gonna call uh, when I wanna talk about economics? It reminded me uh, when I got the phone call about the passing of Dr. Ron Walters. I was giving a speech in San Antonio and I got a text message that he had passed and that literally was the first thing that I thought as well. Uh, thought about family, thought about him, thought about prayers for the family, but man also, who will we now call? Um, I think back to, my goodness, Washington Watch on TV One, which was a Sunday morning show I hosted then. Uh, and we often had uh, Doc uh, on the show uh, talking about economics, talking about the unemployment numbers. Uh, that show ran for four years on TV One. Then, of course, when we had News One Now uh, on uh, TV One as well, and uh, he was a frequent guest. And obviously, when I started uh, this show, this digital show, my network absolutely uh, wanted him on. And, and I always appreciated every month when the jobs report would come out at, uh, that Dr. Spriggs would, would be posting, uh, he would be uh, giving his thoughts and perspective because he centered blackness. And that was the reason why for me, uh, I, I always wanted him on because in every way we center blackness, having him on the Tom Jordan Morning Show. So literally every platform that I've had since 2009, uh, TV One, Tom Jordan Morning Show, this one, 
I, I, would, I would call Doc. I remember when uh, there was an event at Howard University and I forgot what the anniversary was. And Sarah Elizabeth Warren was participating. Uh, and he hit me up and he said, hey, Roland, uh, we're having this event. And again, I cannot remember the anniversary, but, but man, uh, you know, can you live stream it? Of course, that was a no brainer. Uh, it was easy for me to say yes, uh, yes to Bill. Uh, because, uh, you know, he was always there for me. He was always there for us. Uh, his knowledge was indispensable. And the clarity in which he was able to explain uh, these critical, complex economic issues. Joe Madison has a saying, you got to put it where the goats can get it. And that was always uh, our deal. And so he didn't make it hard to understand economics for the lay person, for the person uh, who's at home. And so... Uh, that's why his voice was so important. Uh, I, I, can, I can relish in the fact that it's a whole host of people who uh, he is trained up. Uh, he is not, let me be perfectly clear, there are going to be other voices that we call upon on to talk economics, but Bill Spriss cannot be replaced. Cannot be replaced. Um, his knowledge was critically important. But it, was, but it wasn't just also from a theoretical, professorial perspective. The fact that he led the National Urban League's Washington Bureau, he worked in the Obama administration, all of that was critically important. Uh, and so um, it, is, it is obviously with sadness uh, that he's now an ancestor, but he's left us with so much. Um, I last saw him at Howard University's graduation uh, my, uh, my niece graduated, so I was there taking pictures and faculty was coming in and I was shooting video, taking photos and he sees me and his, his, his eyes light up and he starts smiling, uh, and we, he waves at me, uh, we, we, uh, we greet each other, uh, and, um, that was the last time that I, I, I physically saw him. Uh, and, and so to his family, uh, to his friends and his colleagues understand uh, he was an absolute uh, joy to work with, and we greatly appreciate having him on the show. Uh, I'm sorry I cannot be there. Uh, I agreed to something in Texas a year ago, uh, and I'm, I'm, I'm there, uh, but I'm there with you in spirit. Uh, we paid tribute to him on Roller Martin Unfiltered, uh, and we'll never forget uh, Dr. Bill Spriggs and what he meant uh, to this show. I'll never forget that every time I called him, if he could do it, he was always there. And I appreciate him for that. Uh, and to his family again, our thoughts and prayers uh, to the Howard uh, family. Bill Spriggs was an absolute uh, amazing brother uh, and he will absolutely be missed. Thank you so very much and God bless. If you have not had the opportunity to see the tribute that Roland um, Omari and Greg did on Roland Martin Unfiltered, take a moment to view it on YouTube. Um, I promise you won't regret it. We want to acknowledge the presence of Lisa Darrell Cook, the first African-American woman and woman of color to sit on the Federal Reserve Board of Governors. Lisa, please stand. Omari and Greg and I debated about singling out anyone to acknowledge because we knew that inevitably we would miss someone because Bill was indeed everywhere, but also because as Elizabeth and Jared noted, Bill was somewhat resistant to the idea that anyone, including himself, was special. We joked too about the fact that Bill would have casually retweeted and reposted a statement from the President of the United States about his own passing. <laughs> Casually, I say, because he would have then proceeded to have a full-on labor-related thread that we would have followed because he would have thought well, that would have been more important. In that spirit, we invite all of you who are representatives of or members of the organizations and the departments of which Bill was a part to please stand. On behalf of the family, we say thank you. On behalf of AFL-CIO, we say thank you. On behalf of Howard University, we say thank you. 
Um, in that same spirit, I also must single out the former Dean of the College of Arts and Sciences, Dr. Shagun Badageshan, who has joined us, um, makes very few trips back to campus, but thank you, Badageshan, Dr. Badageshan, for joining us today. The Howard Institute for Public Opinion was one of the places I got to know Bill best. Now, indeed, we were chairs together um, for a short period of time, and Bill was in that group of folks who really helped those of us who were new chairs of departments in the College of Arts and Sciences to find our sea legs. But he left us fairly quickly um, to join the federal administration, but then he came back to Howard and he trusted that we had done well and had brought to all of our chairs and dean's council meetings a sufficient and a requisite amount of tension and aggravation and disagreement and standing for right. In this instance, it was the students on which he always, always spoke on behalf of. He certainly was an advocate for the faculty as well. And in that spirit, I asked the faculty in the Department of Economics, past and present, to please stand. Faculty and students, I should say, because Bill, of course, was an advocate for students to please stand. I invite now Dr. Omari Swinton, professor and chair of the Department of Economics at Howard, to offer tribute on behalf of the department and the university as well. Um, he will be joined near the end of his remarks as the video tribute plays um, by Dr. Linda Jones, assistant dean for finance and administration of the graduate school and a member, a very active member of the very active Economics Alumni Association, Dr. Swinton. Um, good morning. My name is Omari Swinton. I am the chair, director of graduate studies, and the director of the AEA summer program in the Department of Economics at Howard University. I first would like to offer my condolences to Jennifer and Will and all of Bill's extended family. Um, I, I would not be at Howard if it was not for Bill. When, when I finished my PhD, I didn't get any job offers, um, so I had decided to stay at Duke and do a postdoc, but Bill called me late in April and asked me if I was interested to come teach at Howard. Um, I told him I wasn't sure and that I had to talk to my wife. Um, my wife told me that we weren't gonna stay in Durham, so <laughs> we moved to um, DC. Bill supported my career greatly early on. My first major presentation that I gave, presentation that I gave was due to Bill sending me in his place. Bill, encouraged me and believed greatly in my research on HBCUs. One of my first publications was with Bill and Greg Price in a review of black political economy. Then Bill left Howard and went to the Department of Labor. Um, we, the department took over students to talk to him and he expressed such joy in his work that I was amazed. He more or less told me that he enjoyed his work so much that he never realized that it was the end of the day and when he left, he was excited to get back to work and proving people's lives by helping them. When Bill came back to Howard, I was extremely excited. I had this great idea for an NSF grant that I told Bill about. He told me that it wouldn't work, and he gave me another idea, and that's what I wrote my NSF grant on. But he didn't just tell me what I should do. He made, gave me the connections that I needed to make it happen. Our grant is just wrapping up, and the main finding of our grant is black students are more likely to graduate if they attend an HBCU versus a PWI. When I became chair, I had these really big dreams about bringing the American Economic Summer Program, which was started by Marcus Alexis, to Howard University. I talked to Bill about this idea and make sure that he was supported because I knew that I wouldn't be able to get it done without his support. He thought it was a great idea. So we are currently in our third year of the program, and even though Bill was as busy as he did, when we had our meeting in late February, early, uh, early February, late January, to go through the applications, sometimes 150, Bill would sit with us and we'd go through all the applications, and he would help us make decisions on who would come. Last year was our first year in person for the program, and during the open ceremony, I'm very, 
laid back about meetings and don't like long meetings in general. And so I was like, Bill, you want, would you want to talk to the students? Can you talk to them about how? I said, you could take five minutes. He was like, okay. Bill gave a 30-minute love story <laughs> on the value of Howard, the importance of it to the world, and he even told the students who were coming to Howard just for the summer why they should love to be at Howard. He even made them do the H-U. <laughs> See, that's what they did the first time. He's like, no, that's not good enough. Y'all are Howard students now. H-U. <laughs> he did that entire speech off the top of his head. And it just amazed me that, that he could do something. He has such a passion for Howard that I really haven't met anybody else at Howard who has the same passion that he had. You know, this year, the, our program started May 24th, and he fell sick the Monday before the program started, so our students didn't get an opportunity to hear him speak. But that passion that Bill had for Howard came through because he invested in his students and the experience of the HBCU experience. He always showed up. He came to graduations. He came to senior honor dinners. He came to faculty meetings. He came to department meetings. He came to job searches. He came to guest lectures. He showed up to dissertation defenses for students who were not his students. He was always there. Our department would, would never be the same without him. And I speak on behalf of the faculty, students, and alumni of our department when I say he will be greatly missed and remembered fondly. We have started a scholarship in his name in our, in our department in his name. And if you are so inclined, please donate to help us keep his legacy alive in the department. Um, the Howard University Economic Department Alumni Association and I have put together a small slideshow that will show some pictures of Bill and the department. I am pleased on behalf of the Howard University Economic Department Alumni Association, first of all, to give our condolences to the family. Um, we um, have suffered a great loss, but we are so blessed that God has chosen to, for him to cross our paths. So to Dr. Spriggs' family, the Howard University family, the National Economic Association family, the Washington, D.C. community, and the world, Huda, pays tribute to Dr. Williams, William E. Spriggs. Dr. William Spriggs, a giant who walked among us, was our chairman, leader, professor, administrator, mentor, supporter, and friend. He was the gentle wind that gave us a push in the back. He was a ray of sunshine who gave us hope and made us smile. Yet he was also determined, fierce, and focused. Once he made up his mind about something, 
he was committed to seeing it through. Dr. Spears came to Howard in 2005 as our chairman. The Howard University Economics Department Alumni Association was instrumental in securing his appointment as we thought that he was the best person for the job. We were elated when the announcement was made and promptly had a welcome to Howard University and the Department of Economics reception for him in Howard Hall. We did not know what we were getting into when we received Dr. Spriggs, but we soon found out that he had an agenda and a plan, and he worked his plan tirelessly. He brought in world-class economists to speak at our annual Omicron Delta Epsilon Spring Dinner Lecture, like Dr. Andrew Bremer, Dr. Joseph Stiglitz, Dr. James Stock, Dr. Cecilia Rouse, and Dr. Willeen Johnson. He was the catalyst for the Graduate Travel Award that Huda sponsors because he encouraged us to help a student or students travel financially to the conference, the professional conferences. Dr. Spriggs was Huda's biggest supporter and we worked well together. Dr. Spriggs brought a swagger and attitude to the department. He brought respect to the department and we felt he placed us on the map. We are thankful that he was one of us and that he worked on our behalf. As I recall, Dr. Spriggs believed that being at Howard was his dream job. We are blessed that his dream became our reality. He felt that he was destined to come to Howard, and if I recall correctly, his mother and father met at Howard, and he was born at Freeman Hospital. This is our president who wrote this. We are saddened to hear the news of the passing of Dr. Spriggs. We were in a state of shock when we heard the news because we were just together at the Huda sponsored graduate's reception just a few short, week, short weeks ago. His passing really hurt us because it feels like we lost a family member, and we did. On behalf of the Howard University Economics Department Alumni Association, Dr. Spriggs, we are going to miss you, your care, your energy, your enthusiasm, and love. You are a great person to know. May God bless your family, your legacy, as we begin to walk in the steps of a giant. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Spriggs and Dr. Jones. Please welcome now our soloist, Dave Bass, Williams College, class of 1977. Good morning, how's everyone doing? Boy, you must not be doing well. How's everybody doing? Good morning. All right, all right. We all know and you all have heard and you've experienced Bill, but I knew Bill way back when we were college students. But did you all know that Bill had acting chops? Didn't know that, did you? Like James Thurmer said, you could look it up. I happen to have the script. During our junior year, we, Bill and others, we acted in a play called A Raisin in the Sun. And Bill had the role of George Murchison. That was a role made famous by Louis Gossett Jr. We had a great time. Of course, up in Williamstown, <laughs> other than matriculators, not a whole lot to do because it can get cold up there. But back then, we used to talk about a lot of different things in, a, in the lunchroom. And, uh, you know, they'd have the heavy conversations. And Bill was always one of those individuals that would say something that would cause everybody to kind of give pause. And what was really nice about it is because he was heavy with the economics. To a little guy growing up on public assistance in Jersey, listening to all these guys, he always had a way of making it very plain. So to Miss Jennifer and his family, who First of all, I want to thank you for the opportunity to come and be a part of this. But on behalf of all of his friends at Williams College, our class of 1977, all of us who used to be there, uh, I'd like to offer something that speaks to Bill's whole life of commitment and service, because that's what he was about, as you all have experienced. If I walk 
in the pathway of duty. If I work till the close of the day, Lord, I shall see the great king in all his beauty. When I've gone the last mile of the way, Lord, yes, sir. And if I work for Christ to proclaim the glad story, oh Lord, if I see for his sheep who've gone astray, oh Lord, I am sure he would show me in his glory. When I've gone the last mile of the way, Lord, yes, sir. When I go the last mile of the way, oh, Lord, I shall rest at the close of the day, Lord, and for I know there are joys that await me, yes it is. Oh, and I've gone the last mile, yes. When I've gone the last mile of the way, you know the dearest of ties we will sever, oh Lord. Tears of sadness are shed each and every day, oh Lord. But no sickness and no sighing forever. When I've gone the last mile of the way, Lord, yes, sir. When I go the last mile of the way, oh Lord, I shall rest at the close of the day, Lord, and for I know there are joys that await me, yes it is, oh, and I've gone the last mile, yes, when I've gone the last mile of the way. Thank you so much, Mr. Vass. And as we promised, you would learn something about Bill that you did not know. I did not know he, too, was a thespian. <laughs> I'm not surprised, though. Uh, one of the grants that Bill worked on with me in particular was on digital humanities. It seemed he had no bounds. To read tribute letters from Vice President Kamala Harris, Representative Bobby Scott, and Ambassador Jack Markle is Executive Director of the Maryland Hunger Solutions, Michael J. Winston. Uh, Wilson, I apologize, Michael Wilson. These readings will be followed by a video from Dr. Julianne Malvo and remarks by Dr. Bernard Anderson, Dr. Valerie Wilson, and Dr. Lawrence Michelle. Please welcome Michael Wilson. Uh, good afternoon. Um, I, I know I was introduced with the title of uh, my professional title of uh, Executive Director of Maryland Hunger Solutions, but that's really not appropriate. I, the title that I really know that I have is, is, is that Godfather. Um, Bill honored me by asking me to be Godfather for his son, Will, um, as I had asked him to be the Godfather for my son, David. Um, Bill and I were friends. And I know there's been lots of talk about his academic achievements and his excellent policy work 
Um, but I got to tell you, he was, as a friend, such a good guy. And as Omari referred to earlier, you know, he would, uh, he was such a booster of Howard University. To be out there on the, with him in the stands for the football games, um, nobody, nobody said, you know, the way Bill said. And I, I'll give you a chance to try to catch up. Um, you know, for those of you who don't know, the chant for Howard University football games was HU, and the response is, you know. So, HU. You know. Yeah, we, we needed Bill here for that, because you guys, you guys were just not as good at it as, as Bill was, trust me. Um, the other thing I will say about Bill is we had a sort of a informal um, poker game that we would play, and I want you to look at that picture you know, it, 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 you know, imagine playing poker with Bill. So, so you know Bill is smarter, right? You know that Bill is smarter than you. You know that the economist in him has calculated all of the odds, all of the possibilities that he is, he's got it figured out, and yet no matter what his hand was like, that's the face he made. <laughs> That's the face that Bill Sprakes made. And I want you to keep that in mind. Um, I'm, I'm going to read the letters now. Um, first from Vice President Kamala Harris. The family of William Spriggs, PhD, Great Falls, Virginia, to the family of Dr. William Spriggs. Please accept my most heartfelt condolences on the loss of your beloved husband, father, and brother Bill. I was deeply saddened to hear the news of his passing. Bill was a trailblazer an extraordinary public servant and a treasured mentor. He challenged our basic assumptions on racial disparities and fought to build in an economy that worked for everyone. Bill's commitment to ensuring that black workers in every part of our country have the opportunity to thrive will have a lasting impact for generations to come. His wisdom and passion for justice and equity were gifts to those whose lives he touched and he will be remembered for the light he brought to the world. I am deeply grateful for his cherished friendship and mentorship. May the joy and love you shared carry you through this difficult time, and may Bill's legacy live on through all those who knew him. Doug and I will keep your family in our thoughts and prayers. Sincerely, Kamala Harris. Now I have a letter from the Honorable Bobby Scott of Virginia. Uh, dear Mrs. Spriggs, it was with sadness that I learned of the passing of your husband, Dr. William E. Bill Spriggs, on June 6, 2023. My thoughts and prayers are with you and your family during this time of bereavement. Bill will be missed, not only by family and friends, but also by the education and labor communities. Early in his career, he transferred the transformed the lives of students through his work as a professor, including at Norfolk State University, where he was when we met while I was a member of the Virginia State Senate. Throughout his career in academia, his focus was always on the best possible outcomes for students. Bill is perhaps best known for his contributions as an economist and labor leader. His passion for the labor movement began when, while he was a graduate student. In the years that followed, he served in leadership on the local level and as an assistant secretary of labor in the Obama administration. For over a decade, Bill worked as the chief economist for the AFL-CIO and worked diligently to support the organization's mission of fighting for the rights of workers. On a personal note, it was an honor for me to present Bill with the 2016 Robert M. Ball Award for Outstanding Achievements in Social Insurance and his expert testimony at a hearing on gradually raising the minimum wage to $15 helped members of the Education and Labor Committee understand why livable wages are good for business, workers, and the economy. His body of work will continue to shape the dialogue about economics and fairness for years to come. He will be sorely missed. I hope that the, that the kind thoughts of family and friends will help you make your grief a little easier to bear. If there's anything that I can do to assist you during this difficult time, please do not hesitate to call on me. Yours very truly, Bobby Scott. And now the final letter is from Ambassador Jack Markell. Dear Mrs. Spriggs, on behalf of the team at the U.S. Mission of the OECD and Bill's many friends at the OECD itself, I send our deepest condolences. Bill was held in the highest esteem here, and we looked forward to his visits. He was 
as nice and decent as he was brilliant. He made huge contributions here and always insisted that the interests of working people were high on our agenda. Bill leaves a remarkable legacy and so many people are better off thanks to his service. So sorry for your loss, Jack Martell. Thank you. Thank you, Omari Swinton and Howard University for including me among those who are celebrating the life and legacy of Dr. Bill Spriggs. I would wish I could be there, but I'm in Zambia, both vacationing and creating academic opportunities um, with the University of Zambia. Heartfelt condolences to Jennifer and Will and to all the who loved and appreciated Bill. What can I say about Bill Spriggs, the economist, economic advisor to presidents and labor leaders, mentor to many, friend to even more. He was a gentleman and a gentle man. In Du Boisian terms, he was a race man, who was passionate about racial economic equity, who loved black people and historically black institutions. He was also passionate about making the economics profession more accountable around issues of race and racial economic equity. Chiding fellow economists, he chided fellow economists to look at the roots of the assumptions they make. He had the status to do that. He was always well prepared, highly respected, thoughtful, and rather serenely committed to offering critiques when they were required. He was also adept in challenging the status quo, often offering part pointed remarks about the persistence of racial inequality. And he was my go to guest to talk about economic issues on my WPFW program in Washington, D.C. He was also a great phone call when I simply wanted to chop it up about economic issues, HBCU land, racial economic justice, and other things. We enjoyed each other's company and conversation. It is my eternal regret that we did not talk more frequently. Bill and I bonded at an American Economics Associated meeting held in San Francisco in 1983. He said he hadn't seen much of the city, so we took a drive across the Golden Gate Bridge and back, stopping in the hood. He shared that his mom and I share a first name with slightly different spelling and we laughed that we black folks all related. I attended Will's baptism and his high school graduation party. Bill Spriggs was my brother and my dear friend. We have much in common, both labor economists, love for black people, committed to activism and mutual respect. Thanks to Bill, I serve as vice chair of the board of the Economic Policy Institute and have relationship with younger economists like Valerie Wilson and Meyer Rocky Moore Cummings. Bill is a role model and example of the power of one. I will miss my friend. Dr. Maya Angelou perhaps summarized my feelings best in her poem, When Great Trees Fall. When great trees fall, rocks on distant hills shudder. Lions hunker down, tall grasses, and even elephants slumber after safety. When great trees fall in forests, small things recoil into silence, their senses eroded beyond fear. When great souls die, the air around us becomes rare, sterile. We breathe. We breathe briefly, our eyes briefly see with a hurtful clarity. Our memory, suddenly sharpened, examines, gnaws on the kind words unsaid, promise walks never taken, great souls die, and our reality, bound to them, takes leave of us. Our souls dependent on the, their nurtured now, now shrink and wizened. Our minds, formed and informed by their radiance, falls away. We are not so much maddened as reduced to the uniterable ignorance of dark, cold caves. And when great souls die, when great souls die, after a period, peace blooms slowly and always irregularly. Space is filled with a kind of soothing electric vibration. Our senses restored, never to be the same. Whisper to us, they existed, they existed. We can be, be and be better, for they existed. Bill Spiggs did more than exist. He soared, he was a rock star, he shined, and we are better for the life he lived. Thank you. Oh, <clears throat> good morning. Uh, let me begin by saying that I was not aware that I would be asked to make any remarks at this memorial service for my dear friend Bill Spriggs, until I arrived uh, at this auditorium after a train ride from Philadelphia. And uh, the opportunity 
to make a few words uh, makes me feel like a mosquito in a nudist camp. There's so much there, I hardly know where to begin. <laughs> but let me begin by offering my deep condolences to Bill's wife, his family, and on his passing, which hit me very hard when I heard the news. And I will say that I begin my few remarks. I've often been accused of being long-winded, not able to even say my name in less than five minutes. <laughs> but let me begin at, my, at, at the beginning. That I met Bill Spriggs at an NDA meeting, the National Economic Association, which is the professional association of black economists, of which I say I'm one of the founders in 1969, New York City. Um, I met Bill shortly after he earned his PhD degree in economics at the University of Wisconsin, and we hit it off very well immediately because both of us are labor economists. And we discussed our work, our research interests, and began a communication frequently on my research on employment, income, wealth, and the research and activism that he was engaged in. Uh, on this issue. And the thing is this, and I agree with Bill, and I would say this to other black economists, don't spend all of your time in academia. Get out of the academic world, share your knowledge with others, and be engaged in finding policies and practices that will eliminate racial inequality in American economic life. That is the burden for black economists, in my view, and the work that we should be doing. It's okay to be in academia. But speaking personally, I've spent only one third of my career in the academic world, and some of the best jobs I have had, Assistant Secretary of Labor in the Clinton Administration, Director of Programs at the Rockefeller Foundation, uh, chairman of the Fiscal Oversight Board that kept Philadelphia from going into bankruptcy. These are opportunities that black economists should seek and take advantage of. And that is exactly what Bill Spriggs did. I had a long conversation with Bill at this university when he was chairman of the, when he was on the faculty, he wasn't chairman yet, about a Ford Foundation grant that the Ford Foundation was considering to be made to Howard to develop a PhD program in economics. There was no HBCU that had a PhD program in economics, and the Howard University Department of Economics was offered the opportunity to develop one. Now, a, the chairman of the department at that time, whose name will not be mentioned here, developed a proposal that made absolutely no sense. And he discussed it with my dear friend, long departed, that some of you know, Marcus Alexis, wonderful man. And Marcus said, listen, um, let's, let, let's talk to Bill Spriggs and see if he can help shape this proposal so that it will be supported by the Ford Foundation. That is what happened. 
Bill Spriggs got involved. He shaped the proposal. And the Ford Foundation uh, made the award that created the PhD program in economics at Howard University, one of the PhD programs that has produced a landfill of black PhDs in economics that are making their way. The other point that I would make is that after a long period of time, let, 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 let me suggest this, and you forgive the personal reference, but I have to say this. I was the program director for social sciences at the Rockefeller Foundation when Marcus Alexis brought a proposal to me to create a summer institute for minority students in economics. There was some resistance in the Rockefeller Foundation for funding that program because they were not, at that time, uh, very much oriented toward affirmative action. I went to my former professor and mentor, Andrew Brimmer, spoke to him about this. He advised me to put the proposal together and get the a American Economic Association to endorse the proposal and to sponsor the program. That is exactly what happened. And the program was funded for $300,000 for the first three years to be conducted at Northwestern University under the leadership of Marcus Alexis, who was chairman of the economics department at Northwestern University. I was thrilled when I learned that the Summer Institute moved to Howard University, uh, I think it was last year. I will say this, my friends, that program deserves to remain at Howard University. It should not be moved around the country the way it has been since it was created in the 1970s. I forget which year, 1978, 79, or something like that. It needs to remain at Howard University. And I recommend that the name of the program be changed to the William Spriggs Summer Institute for Training in Economics. That's what should be done. Uh, I communicated frequently with Bill when he was with the National Urban League, Washington office, if reference had been made to that, and when he was Assistant Secretary of Labor for Policy, and enjoyed every conversation. But Bill and I did not always agree. But I learned much about economics and the, in the letter that Bill wrote challenging the assumptions. I did not understand that I was uncomfortable with the assumptions made by Bill about by in the economics profession, but you have to absorb that in order to get a PhD degree. That nonsense, you see, about the, the taste for discrimination and this nonsense, you see. The Gary Becker wrote the book in 1957. Uh, Omari Swinton's father, David Swinton, is here with us. Uh, he wrote his dissertation in economics at Harvard, one of the only few, relatively few <laughs> black people to get PhD in economics at Harvard. Challenging that and Bill's letter went a long way toward bursting these bubbles in economics and deepening our understanding of what economics really is and especially what can be done through economics to achieve 
economic equality in this country. So let me, I don't want to go on and on and on. I will end by saying that I've always been grateful for how much I learned and how much I enjoyed my relationship with Bill Spriggs. And I can tell you that he will be deeply, deeply missed. He was a giant scholar, highly effective activist, a genuine, warm, and engaging friend. He will be sorely missed. And I would only say, Bill, my dear friend, rest in peace. Good afternoon. I am Valerie Ralston Wilson, and it is my privilege to share some personal reflections in celebration of the amazing life and legacy of William Spriggs. I first want to offer condolences to Jennifer and Will and members of the extended Spriggs family. I want to thank you for sharing Bill with us and for allowing this time for us to share some of the reasons why he meant so much to many of us. I first met Bill in August of 1999 when he hired me as a research analyst at the National Urban League Institute for Opportunity and Equality. At the time, I was a disillusioned economics graduate student and I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do with the rest of my life. Now, I was about 90% convinced it was not going to involve a PhD in economics, uh, but little did I know, Bill was 100% convinced that it would. Now, anyone who has had a difference of opinion with Bill knows that if he's convinced he's right about something, uh, there's very little chance that you were going to convince him otherwise, and more likely that he was actually going to persuade you to see things his way. So about two years after I started that job, uh, he sent the following email to the entire staff of the National Urban League. And that email started like this. Today is Valerie Ralston's last day with the National Urban League. Hopefully not a farewell, but a break from when she may one day return. She will be resuming her work on her PhD in economics at the University of North Carolina, Chapel Hill. While Valerie was with the league, she was a central figure in restoring our research presence. Now that was an incredibly generous statement for him to make about me at the time, uh, but he went on to detail all of the reports and articles and presentations uh, that I was involved in at the time I was there, many of which were co-authored with him, and why those things were in fact significant. Um, and I kept that email, it was in August 2001 uh, that that email was sent. I printed it, I kept it one because it was incredibly validating for me and I knew that once I went back to graduate school, I would want to have something I could look back on and remind myself why I actually decided to come back. But the other reason I kept that email um, and that you know it remains special to me is because it was quintessential Bill. Um, in the DC world of power and politics, he was really a rare personality. I think everyone here can attest to how smart, um, influential, uh, well-informed, well-connected, well-respected uh, Bill was, but he wasn't content to leverage those qualities just for his own personal gain or to make himself uh, seem better than someone else. But he really had a way of using uh, his light to make others shine brighter. Um, and it was uh, the light of Bill's mentorship and guidance and advocacy that actually persuaded me to go back and finish my PhD and convinced me that a meaningful and impactful career as an economist was actually possible for me. Um, 
I've shared many times before uh, that one of the things that Bill used to tell me is that I was his retirement plan. Um, and I don't think I really knew how profound of a statement that was at the time. But over time, I've come to understand that he realized that the purpose and causes uh, that meant so much to him uh, were really so much bigger than him alone. And one of the most important things that he could do in service to racial justice, economic justice, and social justice uh, is to prepare and make room for the next generation of economists who were interested in those issues as well. Uh, he did that by instilling in me and in others a sense of purpose in that economics could be used to make life better for people and specifically uh, people who are marginalized economically or because of their race or their gender. Uh, but he also did that through his incredible uh, generosity in supporting and promoting the careers of others. Um, there will never be another Bill Spriggs. Um, he's irreplaceable. But I, for one, am incredibly grateful for the privilege of being just one piece of his amazing legacy. Uh, I'm Larry Michelle, and I was privileged to have known Bill for 46 years. Ever since we entered the UW Madison Economics Program together in 1977, he was just 22 years old. Together, we became labor economists. We studied for theory and labor comprehensive exams. We were office mates. We were in student organized study groups on heterodox, heterodox labor economics, the stuff they didn't teach us. We went on strike together, we played softball together, and we had fun. Our lives were intertwined ever since. It should be noted that Bill was the only black person in our cohort of 35, 40 students. And there were no other blacks in the three years ahead of us, nor in the three years that came behind us, so that he was one of about 250 students over a seven-year period. We were colleagues together at EPI in his two stints there, once in the early 90s and once in 2005. There are many EPI colleagues here, the EPI family, that are here to honor him. Um, Bill was deeply involved with EPI even when he wasn't on staff. When we organized the program on race, ethnicity, and economy, finally trying to incorporate race into our program, he organized a workshop held at Howard for a bunch of academics on the East Coast to give us advice. He was the one who advised me to hire Valerie Wilson one of my better decisions. He advised DPI as he serves as an advisor to AFL-CIO presidents, both Liz and Rich Trumka. We were comrades, labor brothers, and friends who always knew we could count on each other. I want to share two conclusions about Bill's life which echoes things that have already been said. But from the long arc of his history, I want to say he was enormously successful in accomplishing what he set out to do. Let me explain. Students in economics are a mixed bag. Um, you know, I have a love and hate relationship with economics, as I'm sure Bill did. Uh, many of the students thought they were there to become technocrats, to learn tools. Or they ended up being trying to replicate some professor of theirs. Well, that wasn't me and it wasn't Bill. We knew that the point of economics was to understand who got what and why and how to make it different and better. We weren't there to study economics, we were there to study the economy.
Bill was very clear from the start. He wanted to learn economics as a tool for black workers, for black betterment, and he was going to teach at an HBCU. Uh, Bill knew that when black workers did well, then all workers will be doing well. His analysis was worker-centered. And he was true to his calling, basically the family business. I mean, he went to North Carolina AT&T, then to Norfolk State, and then to EPI. Um, you know, being chair of economics at Howard and the chief economist at the AFL-CIO signals achievement of his goals, working at the highest levels possible. Becoming a leading public intellectual, articulating the necessity of racial and economic justice. Job well done, Bill. So my second conclusion is that Bill was a giant walking amongst us. That's a word giant we've heard several times today. So I'm going to document why that's true, being, being that kind of an economist. Um, Bill was a reserved person, not loud. Bill, Bill was determined, focused, courageous, and never afraid to speak his truth. I have many mental pictures of Bill in a workshop or an auditorium standing up and saying his piece when not everybody was going to agree with him and he was disagreeing with the, the norms of the room. God bless you, Bill. That's what, why God puts you on earth. Uh, he was ambitious in a good way. And we've already heard he was also kind of stubborn. That didn't mean he was wrong. Uh, consider the extraordinary range of jobs and positions he held. He was an academic and published technical papers. He did policy analysis in government and at think tanks. He was the chief economist at a civil rights group, the National Urban League, as well as our nation's labor federation, the AFL-CIO. That's a remarkable breadth. Uh, he was co-president of our grad student union, the Teaching Assistant Association, the year after we had a strike, and we lost that strike. So it's, it's something when someone picks up the mantle to carry the work forward. He worked at the Departments of Labor and Commerce at the Small Business Administration during the Clinton and Obama administrations. He worked for Congress at the Joint Economic Committee. He was president of the National Economic Association. We've heard about the Association of Black Economists. But he also became the president of the Labor and Employment Research Association, the association of academics and practitioners focused on labor and industrial relations. He's supposed to be serving as that president right now. Uh, Bill's research and writing was impressive for its breadth and depth. Uh, when he came to EPI, in the two years in his first stint, he edited a volume of papers on the striker replacement issue, which was the prominent labor law reform issue of the time. He not only edited the volume, he contributed a paper using late 19th century Massachusetts strike data. A, 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 a remarkable. <laughs> How he even found out about that data, I, I don't even know. Um, he also wrote a groundbreaking paper, paper documenting that the minimum wage helped those with wages above the new threshold, proving spillover effects. That was not something that was common in those days. Another paper critiqued the economic models claiming that NAFTA would increase uh, employment. In those days, the whole economics world thought NAFTA was the uh, cat's meow, uh, not us at EPI, and Bill was right there offering his intellectual efforts. As we heard, his career included engaging top staff and officials at the Federal Reserve Board. He worked with leading union economists to promote good policy for workers of the world at the OECD. He worked on social insurance, both social security and unemployment insurance. And he researched the economic returns to HBCU education, the impact of discrimination on black wages, uh, and documented occupational racial segregation. He attained an even greater public presence after publishing his open letter to economists following Flo George Floyd's death. 
Everybody should read that. That open letter is the culmination of 40 years of research and thinking. It was lucid, it was right, it called out the BS and harm of my profession. And Bill was the right one to prepare that and offer that. And it elevated his presence tremendously. He was just getting started. You know, his passing took him away. He had not yet peaked, that was for sure. Anyway, we lost a great one. I had so much more I needed to learn from Bill, so many more happy moments to share. And as we, as we Jews say, may his memory be a blessing. Zikrano Livracha. I want to invite one final time members of the faculty, staff, students, and alumni of Howard University to please stand as I present just a brief excerpt from the resolution presented to the Spriggs family on behalf of the Board of Trustees. Will all Howard faculty, staff, students, and alumna please stand. And remain standing, if you will, I promise to be brief. Dear Mrs. Spriggs, Dr. Lawrence C. Morse, Chairman of the Howard University's Board of Trustees, who sends his regrets, he's out of the country, and Dr. Wayne A. I. Frederick, respectively, advise you of the adoption of the following resolution by the Howard University Board of Trustees. The Board of Trustees of Howard University wishes to include in its official record an expression of sincere Condolence to Mrs. Jennifer Dover Spriggs and Mr. William Thurman Spriggs, Bachelor of Science in Electrical Engineering in 2017 on the passing of their beloved husband and father, William Edward Spriggs, PhD, brilliant economist, master educator, and fierce proponent of economic justice. Dr. Spriggs, a prolific scholar, author, and public intellectual influenced economic commentary and analysis beyond the classroom, he was a truth teller who spoke to the United States failure to provide true racial and economic equality. Dr. Spriggs worked to dismantle occupational segregation and labor market inequality. We are thankful he returned to Howard University in 2012 after serving as assistant secretary in the Office of Policy at the United States Department of Labor. In every position he held, he was the leader. Howard University remembers Dr. Spriggs as a cherished teacher and mentor who was an extraordinary exemplar of its core values of excellence, leadership, truth, and service. Be it therefore resolved, this expression of sympathy, sympathy in response to the death of William Edward Spriggs, PhD, be spread upon the minutes of the Board of Trustees of Howard University with sympathy and compassion. Dr. Wayne A. I. Frederick, President. Thank you. You may be seated. A brief housekeeping note before Reverend Dr. Walton presents our eulogy. A repass will be immediately following the service in the Hilltop Lounge in the Blackburn Center. And if you're unfamiliar with the campus, just follow the folks who are laughing and talking about Bill. We also want to offer a special thank you to the staff at Crampton Auditorium for all of their work in helping to make the space ready for us today. The next voice you will hear will be Reverend Dr. Vernon C. Walton, senior pastor of the First Baptist Church of Vienna, and the recessional will follow. Dr. Walton will also offer our benediction. Good afternoon to Jennifer Spriggs, to William, and to the entire Spriggs family. I too want to just add my voice to and offer condolences and certainly to share with you our thanksgiving for sharing your husband and your father not only with us but with the entire world. If I could just take a moment of privilege before I begin and just ask each of us Take a moment and just stand to our feet and put our hands together and celebrate the life, the ministry, and the legacy of Dr. William E. Spriggs. 
Let's put our hands together and thank God for his life and his memory. This is, of course, a challenging spot when you are the last on the program. Everything that you wanted to say has already been said. But when I think about the totality of William Sprague and, and all that he, he offers and all that he offered to the world, there's so much that can be said about him. So much has already been said and so much has likewise been written about Bill Spriggs. And depending upon your relationship with him, we're largely determined what some of your fondest memories are or your recollection of the lasting impact that he will have upon your life. Whether you knew him from the AFL-CIO, whether you knew him from Howard University, Norfolk University, government as the Assistant Secretary of Labor, or whether you knew him as simply a family friend. There's a common thread, there's a uniqueness about all of these relationships. And the common thread that gives indication to the type of person that William Spriggs was. I don't believe that there is a person under the sound of my voice, a person who walks this earth who would not agree with me simply that Bill Spriggs was brilliant. Bill Spriggs was not only brilliant, but he was gifted. He was passionate. He was talented. He was principled about the things that he believed. He was a first-class academician. He was a trailblazer. He was a tremendous thought leader and a champion for justice. What do you say about a man who has accomplished so much? What do you say about a man who's impacted so many lives? What do you say about a man who has contributed so much to our lives and contributed so much to society? What do you say about a man who was deeply troubled and bothered by, in some instances, the status quo of his, some of his colleagues? What do you say about a man who was not very tall in statue, but mighty in strength. What do you say about a man who used his gift of intellect to spotlight and to bring attention to economic injustice and equality and social justice? Let me share with you, my friends, a word about the humility of Bill Spriggs. It was January 2014 when I was called to serve as pastor of the First Baptist Church of Vienna. First Baptist Church of Vienna was the local home, the local spiritual home of William Spriggs. And I met William Spriggs as a member of this congregation simply as a man who would worship regularly with his family, simply as a man who has not only worshiped regularly with his family, but in true Baptist spirit, would occupy the same seat in the same section week after week. <laughs> Far left in the rear of the sanctuary. I wasn't introduced to Bill Spriggs as the professor. I wasn't introduced to him as the chief economist. I was not introduced to him as an assistant secretary of labor. I was not introduced to him as one who has written so many papers and so, so notable in the economic community. But I was introduced to William Spriggs as a devout Christian, a family man, with everyday struggles and concerns, trying to do his best to serve God and humanity. 
I met William Spriggs simply as a brother who was working on and working through his faith journey. All I'm simply saying is this. To know Bill Spriggs is to know that he did not lead with his titles nor his credentials on his sleeve. He was a man who literally walked with presidents, but always kept a common touch and was able to walk among people. In fact, it took someone outside of the congregation to really help me to understand the width and breadth and the depth of his collective body of work. And upon discovering this body of work, we had a conversation and I shared with him that I wanted to know more about this particular work. And of course, he desired to help me to understand it in true William Spriggs fashion. And I remember him one particular day coming to my office and sitting there in the chair and talking with great enthusiasm and excitement about the economy and talking with great energy and enthusiasm about, about wealth and public policy and, and unions and the impact of all of these issues in particular on people of color. And yes, even in that conversation, I'd have to stop him to ask him to help me to understand it in layman's terms. And he did so, so eloquently. But it was here, it was in this moment firsthand that I saw his passion. It was here in this moment that I saw firsthand not only his passion, but I heard his passion for the work and the care for people that are impacted by his work. I've lived long enough to know and have served long enough to know that ministry is not one size fit all. William Spriggs' ministry was birthed in numbers. His ministry was economics. His ministry was public policy. He understood the complexities of numbers and concepts. He understood the impact of what happens when economic engines and tools are working, not working at maximum capacity so that everybody could be whole and experience the promise of America. He understood that flaws in the economic engine that go unchecked and unsourced for years and unchallenged for years leads to the marginalization of people and ultimately the marginalization of communities that make it hard for people to rise above their challenge and their plight. If I were to lift a passage today in honor of William Spriggs, there are two passages that come to my mind. The first of which is Psalm 37, verse 23, which simply says, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. And he delights in his way, for indeed, William Spriggs was a good man. The second of which is found in the book of James, James chapter 1, verses 2 and 3. And here's what it says. It says, my brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. Friends and family that have gathered today, I want you to know that William Spriggs, without question, knew how to count. Would you agree with me? And more importantly than simply knowing how to count, William Spriggs understood that God's economy is often very different than the world's economy. He understood his role both here on earth, but also took very seriously his role as an emblem of God. For him, for him there were 
These were not just economic principles. These were heartfelt kingdom principles. He was reminded of the gospel of Jesus where you find these words, for I was hungry and you gave me something to eat. I was thirsty and you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you invited me in. I needed clothes and you clothed me. I was sick and you looked after me. I was in prison and you came to visit me. If you will permit me, let me share with you the William Spriggs remix version. I was hungry and I had a good job with a fair wage. I was thirsty and I had a good job with a fair wage and was able to take care of my own need. So that I was able to satisfy the hunger and quench the thirst. I was sick and I had proper health care and coverage that I could properly be nursed back to health. I was in prison. And when I was in prison, I had access to proper legal counsel in order to receive a fair shot in life. What am I simply saying, and I'm done? Bill Spriggs didn't just count numbers, but Bill Spriggs made numbers count. He didn't just talk about numbers, but he talked about the power of the numbers. He didn't just count numbers, but he made the numbers count. And you may ask, how did he do this? Three things he did. Number one, he was a messenger for the marginalized. He spoke on behalf of those who could not speak for themselves. He spoke and lifted concepts and issues and concerns of those who were living on the sidelines of life. He strongly and firmly believed that everyone needed opportunity and had the capacity to prosper when given a fair shot and committed himself to using his voice to speak to such issues. He was a messenger for the marginalized. But then, secondly, he was a mentor to many. He committed himself to raising a new generation of black economists and thought leaders. And you've heard from some of them today, and many, I'm sure, sit in this auditorium. He committed himself to duplicating himself. He committed himself to ensuring that the legacy would live long beyond him. He never walked through a door and closed it behind him. Rather, he held the door and welcomed others to come sit at the table with him and likewise make a difference. He was a messenger for the marginalized. He was a mentor to many, but then he was a model for most. William Spriggs was not perfect, but William Spriggs was a gentleman. William Spriggs was not perfect, but he was a model for what it means to be a Christian man. He loved the Lord. He was a model for what it means to be a family man. He loved his family. And he was a model for what it means to be a genuine, trusted public servant. He took the sacred trust seriously and lived in such a way that people could trust him and take him at his word. Finally, I leave you with the words of Dr. Benjamin Elijah Mays, once said, I have only just a minute, only 60 seconds in it, forced upon me, can't refuse it, didn't seek it, didn't choose it, but it's up to me to use it. 
I must suffer if I lose it, give an account if I abuse it, just a tiny little minute. But eternity is in it. Thank you, William Spriggs, for using your minute wisely. Thank you, William Spriggs, for blessing not on, being a blessing not only to your family, but for being a blessing to the entirety of the world. Amen. Shall we pray? Dear Master, we thank you for the life, for the ministry, for the legacy, for the witness of your son, William E. Spriggs. We thank you for what he has meant to the world. And we thank you for his ability to help us to move forward. Now, Lord, we pray for this family. We pray for this wife. We pray for this son. And we pray, dear Master, for the entirety of the family and friends and this campus community. Pray, God, that you would hold each of them in the palm and hollow of your hand. And we pray that your peace will give guidance to our lives. May your spirit fall and may he live in our hearts forevermore. Now may the grace of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ and the sweet communion of the Holy Spirit. He who has, to he who has given us life, that we might have life more abundantly. May you grant us thy peace. May you grant us thy strength as only you can do. For this is our prayer. In the name of Christ we pray. And all of God's children say amen.